Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lu, for this generous introduction. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me. It is indeed an extraordinary pleasure uh, to open such a prestigious and traditional meeting in high-performance computing. As Professor Lu said in her introduction, I am both a professor of computer science at uh, TU Dresden and a research group leader in a biology research institute, the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics. This may seem like an exotic combination. It did certainly seem so 17 years ago when we started. Nowadays, I'm very happy to see that the field of high performance computing in the life sciences is steadily growing. And I hope that by the examples that I'm going to present, I can convince you that um, problems from biology and medicine are not only extraordinary technology drivers for high performance computing, but that high performance computing can contribute uh, uh, to the application area uh, as well. Biology at the moment is at a turning point. For the last five years or so, we are able to image entire embryos, as you can see on this slide here, over the lifespan of their development at cellular or subcellular resolution. On this slide, I'm showing a fruit fly embryo. It's a model organism that we frequently use in our research, but the technology developed for fruit flies and fish is equally applicable to higher organisms such as mouse and human. The top picture here shows a in situ stain by which you can see which cell expresses which gene. In order to perform this stain, however, the embryo needs to be killed and the sample needs to be fixed, but then it provides beautiful spatial resolution that tells us, for example, that some cells express, I call it now, the blue gene, some cells express the orange gene, and some cells the green gene. If we do not fix the embryo, we have nowadays 3D microscopes that provide movies of this sort. And I will let this movie play through in order for you to appreciate the beauty of embryogenesis. Um, it starts from about 1,000 cells and goes on to a couple of tens of thousands of cells. This is the view from the front. This is the view from the back. You see here, for example, the formation of the head furrow. You will see a little bit further down the line the formation of the mouth of the fly. You see the flow of the tissue around the back, and you will see the formation of the body segments. Eventually, now this is the mouth here, uh, opening uh, of the fly. Eventually, some bright cells appear at the interior. These are the cells of the nervous system. Uh, the nervous system of the fly develops, the muscles get innervated, and eventually this fly embryo will move out of the microscope all by itself. So these modern microscopes, light sheet microscopes, bezel beam microscopes, digital lattice microscopes, provide three-dimensional imagery in high resolution, uh, these are the nerve cells here, the, the bright thing is, in high resolution uh, 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 voxel blocks, and they do not harm the embryo. We can image an entire embryo from the fertilized egg until it moves out of the microscope by itself and continues its life as it would. The big question, of course, that remains to be answered is how do these spatial patterns of gene expression that have been traditionally studied in the life sciences set up this spatiotemporal process of self-organization down here? How does a cell in the blue region know which way is out and which way is in when the embryo folds? How does a cell in the orange band know when it has met a cell from the other orange band as opposed to one from the same? And how do the green cells know which way to push such that the extension of the tissue around the back of the embryo has the correct orientation? There is no master cell, there is no boss cell that would tell all the cells 
what to do at any point in time and space. Instead, what we're looking at is a massively parallel and fully self-organized system in which we can view every single cell as a processing element that executes programs. And the language in biology already makes that clear as we talk about genetic programs or gene expression programs, cell-cell communication programs, cellular decision-making, signaling networks or signal transduction networks, or something like endosomal sorting, which is the process depicted here on the right, by which cells take up material from the outside and then process it and decide which molecules are going to the nucleus, which molecules are going to be recycled back. By the way, this uh, uh, an endocytic machinery here by which cells take up chemical signals from the environment has recently been shown uh, to be an analog to digital converter in its basic end-to-end -end functionality. Yeah. So, and the link to computer science is clear here. We talk about programs, we talk about networks, we talk about sorting, and of course the cells are not doing that in isolation, but they are all uh, connected uh, to each other and they communicate via a multitude of signals. Uh, chemical signals, of course, are the historically most well-known. Uh, hormones, growth factors, uh, chemical signals, but also mechanical signals. Cells can sense mechanical stresses and forces and direct cell-cell contacts by which they can communicate with their neighbors and they can know who their neighbors are. And of course, they can change dynamically the neighborhood by motion. Um, again, what you see here uh, on the right is a computer simulation from the lab of Elliot Myrowitz at Caltech, which basically shows a top view of a stem of a small flower called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's a small white flower that grows by the wayside. Uh, and if you cut the flower, this is what the stem looks like from the top with the individual cells. And again, they were able in a computer simulation to reconstitute the cell-to-cell -cell signaling network, which spontaneously leads to the emergence of a pattern by which the cells in the center of the stem know that they're in the center and they will start to grow a new flower. Now, for this massively parallel computer, if every cell is a processing element, we are talking about a highly interconnected computing system here, um, which is able to break uh, several complexity limits and solve NP-hard problems with billions or hundreds of billions of processing elements. And we know a lot about the hardware of this computer. This has been decades of research or centuries of research in biology that we know the proteins, the molecules, uh, uh, the lipids, the fats, uh, out of which this computer is made. And I call that the hardware of this uh, 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 biological computer. We also are able, uh, thanks to sequencing technology, to read the source code of this computer, which is the genomic sequence. However, we have no idea what algorithms this source code implements on this hardware. Gene Myers, one of the uh, founders and heads of the Human Genome Project and chief scientific officer of Celera Genomics when they sequenced the human genome for the first time, once told me that when they started sequencing the human genome, they told the US government that once we know the sequence of letters in our genetic code, we will be able to understand how the human body works and we will be able to cure every disease. Uh, now, he tells that as an anecdote nowadays, because obviously that is not the case, because what we have in the genetic code is a couple of gigabytes of AGCTs, and we know as little about them as before, because we know neither the grammar of this code, nor the algorithms that this code implements, nor the compute model of the hardware, which is certainly not a Turing machine. What we would like to do is to discover these algorithms. And we do that by using high-performance computing and also developing high-performance computing technology in order to both observe the systems and simulate the systems in a hypothesis-driven way. On the observation side, we are talking about these high-resolution 3D microscopes that can image developing embryos over the lifespan of development in order to study tissue formation, in order to study the very emergence of life from a single cell. And the first thing you might want to do is to look at these images. Now, this may sound like something simple, but it's made hard by the sheer size 
of these data sets. When we image the fruit fly embryo over the 72 hours of development, this is about 180 terabyte of image data. Um, now, visualizing this in itself um, is challenging, and even more challenging, we would like to visualize them in real time. Um, that means we need here a rendering performance or a rendering throughput in a real-time visualization system of about 1.8 uh, gigapixel per second. This allows us to directly view the images from the microscope as they are being acquired in a virtual reality or an augmented reality environment and to allow the scientist to basically immerse in the developing embryo, to walk around in the developing embryo, to stick her head inside the developing embryo and see what the cells are doing on the inside that uh, in the microscopes you typically only uh, see the outside. And you can see this here on this uh, picture uh, below, which is a photo from uh, the virtual reality cave at the Center for Systems Biology, um, which visualizes in this case a fish embryo with the blood vasculature uh, 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 highlighted and the bright dots that you see in the image are the red blood cells. In parallel, we want to stream this data into a HPC system that performs online image analysis. Again, we're talking about data streams anywhere in the range of uh, one to five uh, gigabyte per second. And for this kind of stream, we would like to uh, perform image denoising, image segmentation, uh, tracking of the objects, so the computer knows at any point in time, for example, um, what the geometry of the vascular network is, where every red blood cell is, and with which velocity it moves. We can then use these three-dimensional geometry models to simulate uh, physics-based hypotheses, for example, to solve um, the governing equations of blood flow, of fluid flow, in order to predict what the flow would look like. And in order for this, again, to be real time, we require simulation uh, 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 step size, or, uh, uh, wall clock times per simulation time step that are below one second per step. The rendering delay of our current system from the microscope to the cave is about 80 milliseconds. Um, we can directly immerse in a developing embryo. We can process the images faster than the microscope can acquire them. And we can solve, for example, uh, the fluid flow equations in this vasculature and then use the velocity of the red blood cells which can be observed to calibrate the simulation and then read out of the simulation things that cannot be directly measured such as the pressure in the flow for example or the wall shear stresses that the flow exerts on, onto the vessel. And we combine uh, uh, this uh, technology and these pieces of software that we have developed over the years, scenery for the virtual reality part, uh, PPMRC for real-time computer vision, and OpenFPM as a simulation platform in a classical reverse engineering loop, which of course starts with visualizing large data sets, analyzing large data sets in real time, but also has the numerical simulation component for example, here, uh, hello, yes, for example, here um, we imagine that this uh, fly embryo that you see in the top image is sliced open along a meridional line and unwrapped into a plane, and then we solve equations that describe the movement of the cells and we get these beautiful velocity fields uh, of how presumably the cells move if this is indeed the physics. Uh, according to which the embryo behaves. And we rely then still on uh, comparison of the simulation and the data by uh, humans. Again, I uh, cannot change the slide. Could someone in the back please change the slide? Yes. So we rely on comparison by humans in the augmented and virtual reality environment because even 
genetically identical embryos behave slightly differently, and there's no reason to believe that the simple mechanical theory from physics would be anywhere realistic in describing uh, embryogenesis, but we want that the biological essence of the process is captured, which means the onset of the fold should have the right timing, uh, 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 the formation of the head furrow should happen at the right position, and so on. And this is very easy to check in the virtual reality environment where uh, the two can be overlaid, and then the biologists can use uh, hand gestures or some other input modalities to mark areas in the embryo where it fits and to mark areas in the embryo where it does not fit. And this is then fed back into a learning algorithm um, which tries to identify the mathematical model that describes the dynamics uh, observed uh, directly from the data and the user input. Okay, now we have to go back. That was too fast. And all of this is based on a single platform, on a high performance computing software platform, um, OpenFPM, that I'm going to describe in a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, next. I would just say next from now on. Can we do it like this? Okay. Um, so, uh, a little bit about the learning. Um, we are interested in learning mathematical models from image data because they are interpretable and because the goal of the exercise is to understand the physics according to which embryogenesis occurs and maybe even to learn new physics uh, of embryogenesis. So for this we are working on um, inference algorithms that will take images as input. For example here, um, this is the fertilized egg as it polarizes the head-tail axis. Uh, or this is a bacterial colony where the bacteria move around and swim around. And then these images can directly be fed into an inference algorithm which then learns uh, the governing equations, in this case ordinary or partial differential equations that describe the dynamics um, that we observe uh, in these videos. Uh, and this work has been presented actually last week at the New York Data Science Summit. Um, it's starting to work even on noisy data and it allows us to close the reverse engineering loop where in real time we can not only fit parameters of models but we can really learn uh, the models and the equations that describe embryogenesis. Now before giving you a more, uh, actually a very current example of what this can do, um, I will uh, 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 provide a bit of historic background of where this came from. Um, I started about 17 years ago to simulate biological processes and biological systems uh, on HPC uh, machines. This is the beautiful machine that I used in the year 2002, an NEC SX5 um, in uh, the National Supercomputing Center in Switzerland. Uh, the machine had 512 processors, and we used this machine uh, to simulate a tiny, very, very small and probably insignificant biological process, but nevertheless a biological process, and that is the production and transport of proteins in a subcellular compartment of very complex geometry. This compartment is called the endoplasmic reticulum, and it is what every cell of ours contains in order to produce proteins, new proteins, and uh, also certain lipids. And of course, how these proteins move uh, in this complex uh, uh, shaped space is important for its function. Um, you can see here a visualization of the simulation from actually 2005, the movie still plays, uh, of how uh, an initially empty part of the organelle gets filled uh, by transport of proteins into it. This simulation um, had about one billion degrees of freedom, so one billion unknowns um, that needed to be solved for. We used not the full machine, but 242 processors of the SX5 um, at 84% efficiency. And the important number I want to point out here is, is this one here, the custom Fortran 90 MPI code that we wrote for this simulation took three years, uh, uh, three person years uh, to be developed, uh, uh, debugged, and put into production. But the simulation fit 
real experimental data pretty much perfectly. What you see here is uh, a plot of how the influx into this initially empty uh, part of the compartment uh, uh, behaves over time, and the symbols are real experimental measurements from live cells, and the lines are the results of the simulation. The two lines and the two uh, 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 classes of symbols in this plot are different because they are from two different cells. Um, this allowed us, for the first time, to quantify, really, cell-to-cell -cell differences that are due to geometry, that are due to the shape of the organelle, and to measure the molecular diffusion constant of protein in vivo, in living cells, by fitting simulations uh, to data. And in this case, uh, the protein had a diffusion constant of 34 square microns per second. And as you can see from the standard error of the measurement, this is a fairly precise um, estimate now. Um, to, just to give you the context, before we had the simulation in the real geometry, we used very simplified biophysical models, and they had um, a prediction accuracy, or I shall say an error, of 250%. So we go from 250% error down to something like 5% error. In 2005, CSCS bought a bigger and more powerful machine that was a Cray XT3, and we used the Cray XT3 then to extend our simulations. It made it possible, thanks to the increased power of this installation, uh, to do the same simulation now on the surface of this complex geometry, where you need to take into account the differential geometry, uh, the Riemannian metrics, and a lot of additional mathematical objects that need to be discretized in order to uh, simulate these flows in these curved uh, 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 and complex uh, uh, shaped uh, 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 organelles. Now, of course, until here, it's all chemistry. We are simulating the production or the chemical reaction of a protein and its transport, its passive transport by, by diffusion. And this is because, naturally, Alan Turing, uh, the famous computer scientist, also wrote an uh, equally famous publication in biology in 1952, um, which was entitled The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. In this publication, he hypothesized that biological morphogenesis, the generation of form and function in biological systems, is governed by reaction diffusion systems. It's ultimately governed by chemistry, so the hypothesis here is that the cellular computer is a chemical computer. Since about 2010, however, we know that this is not sufficient to explain anything interesting in higher organisms. Uh, Turing systems uh, work reasonably well in bacteria, but they would not work to explain uh, how a fruit fly embryo develops. Um, instead, uh, Joe Howard from Yale University and Stefan Grill uh, and Justin Boyce proposed as Turing's next step that we should also account for the mechanics, that the mechanical properties of these tissues, when coupled uh, to the chemical regulation, um, are uh, what brings about the spontaneous emergence and the spontaneous self-organization uh, of shape and form. And here is an example uh, from our recent work where you can clearly see that mechanics is important and that disease phenotypes can actually be mechanical. Again, what you see is a fruit fly embryo now a little bit later in its development, and this is joint work with Elizabeth Knust from the Max Planck Society, who is a uh, very experienced fly biologist. What you see in the top video here is a process called dorsal closure. It is the process by which the back of the embryo closes. Um, you see initially uh, the embryo was open, there was a tissue that contracted, and in the end the hole is closed. And this is what dorsal closure looks like in a mutant. It does not close, the tissue moves around pretty much chaotically. The video stops at some point here for ethical reasons because you would see the guts and inner organs of the fly come out and the embryo will eventually die. Um, the mutation here, and that's quite remarkable, is a single point mutation. In one protein called crumbs, uh, there is a single amino acid substitution. So one amino acid gets substituted for another one in crumbs. So this is one point mutation in the genome 
if you wish, of the fly. Now, of course, we can ask the question, how does this single genetic perturbation lead to such a drastic change in the tissue phenotype? Why, why does dorsal closure not just look a little bit different uh, in this mutant, but is completely aberrant? And of course, this is relevant also for medical applications as uh, uh, babies that uh, are born with an open back um, are indeed uh, a consequence of a failure of dorsal closure. And humans have the very similar gene. Humans also have crumbs. Um, and it's pretty much conserved from the fly. So again, this thing. So we need to take into account the mechanics because we're talking about flows here and about rearrangements uh, of the tissue, but what mechanics? Um, and here, of course, there is a beautiful model from physics. The answer is um, complicated mechanics. Um, and I just want to give you a glimpse. I'm not going to show you the equations because the governing equations of tissue biomechanics are highly nonlinear coupled partial differential equations that are exceedingly difficult to solve. But people like Frank Ulicher from the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems, together with his colleagues uh, in Paris, Jacques Pro and Jean-François Joanny, they wrote down a beautiful physical theory which explains the mechanics and behavior of materials that are able to move and deform by themselves. These are so-called active materials, and because these materials are neither solids nor fluids, but something in between, the theory is called the theory of active polar gels. It takes into account that within every cell of the tissue there are filaments, there are polymers of the cytoskeleton, in this case actin filaments, on onto which motor proteins walk. These motor proteins walk on the filaments by consuming a chemical fuel and converting that chemical energy into mechanical stresses. And this happens in every single cell of our body. Of course, it's most obvious to us in muscle cells, which do this in a coordinated fashion, such that in the end we get uh, a macroscopic bulk movement uh, uh, from within uh, that is, of course, uh, generated by the exact same process. And the theory, the partial differential equations, allow us now, um, if we are given a polarity field, which means in each point of the tissue, we know the orientation of the filaments. This is called the polarity field. And we are also given, in each point of the tissue, the density field. So we know the density of the filaments. And we know across the tissue what is called the chemical potential field, that's simply the abundance or the availability of fuel. Then by solving these equations, you can predict the velocity with which the tissue is going to move and deform, the spatially resolved velocity field, and the internal forces or pressures that are generated during this deformation or in order to drive this deformation. Now, until about three years ago, nobody was able to solve these equations. It's nice that these equations would allow us, in principle, to predict how tissues move and what forces they generate in doing so. But if the only thing we can do is analytical work with paper and pen in symmetric one-dimensional cases, this is of very limited utility. And uh, again, about three years ago, we developed the first numerical method uh, for this uh, set of equations, uh, and there were of course, technical difficulties in that because the equations are nonlinear, uh, uh, fourth order, tightly coupled. They contain instabilities uh, that all make them uh, a little bit uh, difficult to work with. But now we are able to simulate, in this case, this is a numerical solution of a velocity field that you would get in response to a certain orientation of filaments and to a certain distribution of fuel. Now, of course, the input variables, the polarity field, the density field, and the chemical potential field, we can directly read out of the images by means of some simple uh, low-level image processing, and then hopefully solve these equations to tell us what's happening. So let's apply this theory to uh, the fruit fly embryo, and let's take a piece of this contracting tissue out, and I show here uh, a cartoon of the cells. The bottom would be the inside of the embryo, the top would be the outside of the embryo, uh, and uh, the contractile forces are generated in the top part of the cells, where this filament network and the motor proteins are located. So this is where the tissue will start to contract itself uh, in order to eventually close 
the whole. And we model this top part of a cell with a simple uh, computational domain in our simulation where we have this active material, this active polar gel, with a certain polarity field and a certain velocity field um, swimming on top of a passive fluid, which is the internal fluid of the cell, the cytoplasm, uh, where uh, uh, there are no motor proteins, so this is a passive viscous fluid. And on top, we have the cell membrane, which is a lipid membrane, again, modeled as a passive uh, fluid. Now, these three fluids are not separated by walls, but they are, so to say, swimming on top of each other with friction boundary conditions in between. And we want to solve this complex model now of active polar mechanics with chemical regulation in this three-layered uh, system with friction boundary conditions. What we find in the simulation is some novel behavior. What was known before from analytical work is that if the activity of the motor proteins, which is plotted here on the x-axis, is below a certain threshold, then nothing moves. The tissue is static. And you need to overcome this uh, sort of like stick friction. Uh, you need to inject enough energy into the system um, that it starts to flow. And this transition from static to flow is a linear first order transition that can be found by uh, linear stability analysis of the equations. And there is an analytical expression for exactly uh, at what motor activity this happens. And so here, everything is normalized with respect to that activity. What we found in the simulation is two further transitions that are not known analytically because they are nonlinear transitions. The first transition turns the flows into a field of traveling waves and vortices. And the second transition leads to chaos, spatial temporal chaos, as of course measured by uh, the Lyapunov exponent of the system, which is plotted here as a dashed line, being positive. Lyapunov exponent below zero means everything is stable and well behaved. The system flows in a controlled way. Lyapunov exponent positive means that the slightest perturbation of the system will lead to completely chaotic behavior. And you see that here in these videos, this is what the uh, uh, flow regime looks like, where you get basically a coordinated motion of the tissue here from left to right, a little bit of retrograde flow on the top, um, but all in all, if you do this from both sides, you will close the gap. Um, this is what the traveling vortices look like in the simulation. And again, this is active mechanics. This is not inertial uh, uh, turbulence. And this is what the spatial temporal chaos looks like. And now, of course, this very much looks like what the poor mutant embryo um, is suffering. So our hypothesis here was that um, something in the mutant causes a dysregulation of the activity in the tissue, uh, allowing the activity to shoot up too high, and then the tissue simply becomes chaotic because it has no choice. That's the physics according to which these materials have to behave. And indeed, then prompted by this hypothesis that came out of the simulation, uh, Ellie Knust and her lab um, did biochemical experiments, and they found indeed that the mutation is in a part of the protein which is implicated in regulations of the motor proteins. So we have a complete end-to-end -end explanation now going from the molecular process with the binding domain of the regulator uh, uh, all the way through the physics to the tissue phenotype, and we know now which molecules to tweak and how to tweak them in order to prevent this phenotype from happening, even in the mutant. And this, to me, is a very nice example of how high-performance computing and these numerically intricate simulations that we can do with these machines allow us to bridge really from the molecular scale to the tissue level scale uh, in order to explain how things work and in order to propose uh, remedies. The numerical method we are using to do so are particle methods or hybrid particle mesh methods. They're an interesting class of numerical methods, which I want to describe shortly. They discretize the system by particles. So if you have a complex geometry like uh, this piece here, um, you don't need to generate the mesh for the simulation, but you simply fill this geometry with particles um, that store the variables. And then there can be a mesh in addition in order to do far field uh, equations in order to compute, for example, forces uh, or far field equations. and the uh, 
particles are initialized on the mesh node and then move uh, from there as driven by the flow. So it's a Lagrangian discretization scheme in which the particles move with the flow. They interact with each other in order to model the mechanics. The hydrodynamics, the hydrodynamic background of the material is solved using classical finite difference schemes on the mesh. And we have interpolation schemes to interpolate variables from the mesh to the particles and back that exactly conserve the physical moments. So they conserve mass, they conserve energy, they conserve impulse, uh, which is what we want to have. So this is the classic framework of particle mesh, mesh methods to solve partial differential equations, but particle methods uh, as an algorithm are much more general than that. I would define everything as a particle method that is composed of dots or zero-dimensional elements that are characterized by a position in some space and certain properties that they carry. And now of course, such an algorithm can be used to solve partial differential equations where the particles are the collocation points of your discretization and they store the values of the field at that position. And partial differential equations are an example of a continuous deterministic model. A model where we have continuous mathematical fields that evolve in space and time according to deterministic rules. But particles can also almost trivially be used to simulate discrete models where we don't have continuous fields uh, uh, to solve for, but discrete entities, um, such as atoms in a molecular dynamics simulation or uh, cars in a road traffic simulation where each atom or each car would be represented by a particle that again interact according to deterministic rules, uh, atomic force fields for example, in order to evolve in time. And of course the interactions between the particles can be stochastic too. There is nothing that limits us uh, uh, to having particles interact in a deterministic fashion and this then also allows us to solve uh, stochastic differential equations numerically um, or to perform agent-based simulations or agent-based modeling in the social sciences um, or uh, economy where the individual particles represent agents that participate in a process and behave stochastically. And if we keep this in mind, then I think it is safe to say that particle methods as a numerical framework, as an algorithmic framework for simulations are the most universal algorithmic framework. Finite elements can, of course, do the continuous part here. Uh, some other piece of software may be able to do this part here. But if we had a software library to perform arbitrary particle methods, then we would presumably be able to simulate models of all four kinds with the same software. Now, this is an example of a, uh, a particle method for a continuous problem where we see a moving and deforming surface uh, with an evolving Turing system on top uh, in an attempt, a very early attempt, to uh, uh, provide something that uh, shows morphogenesis, something that uh, uh, organizes into a shape uh, all by itself. Of course, here is a uh, coarse-grained molecular dynamic simulation, which is a particle method for a discrete uh, uh, model where we have discrete molecules that jiggle and wiggle around and eventually bind to these polymer filaments and then move along them and then fall off again. But particle methods are not limited to simulations. We can also phrase classical computer vision algorithms like this uh, snake algorithm here, this active contour algorithm to segment objects in images as particle methods. What you see here is um, the output of a uh, particle snake that tracks these uh, fluorescent objects. These are endosomes in a cell, doesn't really matter. Um, and why is this a particle method? Because the red outlines here are described as splines and the control points or the nodes of these splines can be seen as particles that have a certain position and a certain property, which is their weight, their interpolation weight. And we can also phrase optimization or learning problems in the particle methods framework. What you see here is a, uh, a stochastic optimization algorithm um, which tries to find the global optimum in a function. You see in the background the isolines of a function that has many, many local minima. So these are all these basins here. And actually the global minimum is the one here on top, um, which is what we would like to find. And we are using an algorithm here, which is a particle swarm uh, algorithm that 
adaptively samples this landscape, so the black dots are the particles, you can think of them as agents that move over this landscape, communicate with each other in order to eventually collectively find the global minimum of this highly non-convex problem. So also computational optimization and learning can be phrased um, in the framework of particle methods. And this means that this algorithmic framework of particle methods, not so much the mathematical framework, provides a unifying view for computation in which particles interact with each other in order to, for example, numerically discretize and solve a mathematical model, such as a partial differential equation, or in order to directly mimic the interactions or processes in a physical or economic or societal system where the governing equations may not and need not be known. We can also directly simulate that. We can combine it with meshes uh, uh, using moment conserving interpolation schemes. And all that our software needs to be able to do is to solve these two ordinary differential equations down here. One that describes the motion of each particle, how the position of each particle changes with time, and one that describes how the properties of each particle change with time. And in the most general formulation, this can be a function of the positions and properties of all other particles in the system through some kernels that I call here k and f. So k and f are functions, and depending on what I put into these functions, I can make the particles move and evolve differently. This is perfect from a software engineering point of view because we can think of a HPC application platform that does all the tedious work um, automatically and only requires the user to provide an implementation for K and F with a very defined uh, footprint. It takes two particles as an argument and it produces a scalar as a result. And I provide function pointers to the implementations of K and F to the software library, and everything from there is handled automatically. We started uh, to work on this. Again, there is some problem with the connection here. We started to work on this about 15 years ago. Um, no, back please. We started to work on this about 15 years ago under the name PPM, the Parallel Particle Mesh Library, which was initially a Fortran 90 library, was later uh, uh, refactored in Fortran 2003 in an object-oriented way. And the goal of the PPM library was to make implementation of particle methods on parallel computing platforms easy and to reduce code development times, ideally without losing scalability or performance. So the PPM library had two parts, what we call the PPM core, which is implementing all the communication primitives, the load balancing, the file I.O., uh, the distributed data structures, and the PPM numerics, which implements frequently used numerical solvers, multigrid solvers, fast multiple methods, Fourier transforms, and so on. It does this in parts by using the abstractions from the core and in parts by wrapping third-party libraries such as Petsy or FFTW. On top of PPM, there is a domain-specific programming language called PPML, the PPM language, which provides a reasonably simple way of coding PPM, but you could also directly interface with the API, with the Fortran API. And then on the applications that use PPM in order to do, for example, plasma physics or astrophysics or biology or fluid mechanics, um, we call them clients. So these are the client applications. And the PPM library um, used overloading and generic interfaces in order to provide implementations of the important routines for different hardware platforms. Vector processors like the NEC A65, shared memory computers, distributed memory computers, or even single cores. Um, and of course, because of the use of overloading, the amount of source code in the PPM library was huge. Several uh, millions of uh, lines of code that needed to be uh, maintained here and, 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 and ported. What we liked about PPM was the abstractions on which it is based. Uh, it's a set of abstract data types and abstract operators for parallel computing that are, in our opinion, the most coarse-grained abstractions possible 
that still cleanly separate computation from communication. So in PPM, an abstraction would either only compute but not incur any communication overhead, or it would only communicate but not do any any computation. And this would allow you already at the high-level description on the domain-specific language uh, to estimate the scalability or the communication overhead that you could expect uh, from your application. This has been used by us and others to do some remarkable simulations. Now all of this is again 10 years old and older. I would just like to point out uh, a few of them. The first uh, uh, simulation that you see here, a vortex method for incompressible fluid mechanics with 10 billion unknowns um, was at least at that time uh, on 16,000 processors of an IBM Blue Gene L, um, the largest particle simulation ever done. Um, another piece of, uh, 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 another result that I like is this one here. A smooth particle hydrodynamic simulation of astrophysics reached 91% parallel efficiency, which is comparable to what the astrophysics SPH code of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics achieves, which was developed over uh, many, many years by a team of experts. And this PPM client here was developed by a first year undergrad as part of a lecture exercise. And I also like this one here, a discrete element method uh, simulating an avalanche of grains down an inclined plane, um, which uh, a colleague and I together implemented in one day. So PPM really reduced code development times, but it was still limited and complex to maintain itself, which is why five years ago we decided to refactor again to keep the abstractions to keep the definitions of the data types and the operators, but now implement a C++ library, which is called OpenFPM, the Open Framework for Particle Methods, uh, uh, make use of template metaprogramming in C++ for compile time code generation. OpenFPM, despite the fact that it can do much more than PPM, for example, it can do simulations in arbitrary dimensional spaces, where PPM was limited to 2D and 3D, OpenFPM allows particle properties to be objects of any C++ class um, that the user can define. And all the communication and file I.O. will transparently work for it. Um, but because uh, template metaprogramming uh, uh, reduces the amount of code that we need to write, uh, it has about a factor of 10 less complexity than the PPM project had. This is also why the different architectures are now not side by side anymore, because we're not using overloading. Um, but at compile time, you have to decide for which type of platform you want to compile. And then uh, the compiler through TMP um, will generate very compact code that is uh, targeted uh, to that platform. Of course, like PPM, OpenFPM also provides dynamic load balancing. Again, made easy that you can simply say something like particles.decompose. The particles will be decomposed in a domain uh, decomposition across your machine. And particles.redecompose will take care that this domain decomposition will follow the evolution of the simulation. What you see here is a classical test case in fluid mechanics, it's called the dam break experiment, where you have a block of water initially on one side of a box and a steel, uh, a steel beam uh, in the center, and then the water slushes around the beam. Um, it's a pretty nasty problem with singularities, um, but the important part here is that initially, of course, when all the water is here, all the particles are here, and the domain decomposition decomposes this onto four processors. But as the particles move through the domain, the domain decomposition follows um, uh, and automatically adapts to it, so the uh, 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 simulation has a good load balance. This means we can implement very compact, scalable simulations. You see here some examples, again, the dam break experiment from fluid mechanics. This is an example here uh, 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 from, from astrophysics. This down here is a compressible fluid simulation of two smoke rings intersecting with each other. Um, this is a discrete simulation of grains, sand grains or salt grains uh, drizzling down a plane. And this is, again, a biological model um, that describes the formation of vesicle-like membrane structures and their dynamics. And you see that only a few hundred lines of C++ code needed to be implemented for each one of these simulations. And each one of these simulations ran 
on a distributed memory computer, run on graphics cards, had uh, file I.O., had visualization capabilities, was able to talk to Paraview, uh, so we could directly produce these images here. Uh, and the efficiency and the computational performance we get out of these clients was comparable uh, to those of uh, uh, state-of-the-art codes in the field. Uh, for example, uh, we compared the performance in a molecular dynamics simulation with LAMPS, which is a uh, widely used open source molecular dynamics code, and you can see that both the wall clock time on the left and the parallel efficiency uh, on the right are similar. Um, we compare the performance of SPH simulation with a framework called Dual SPH, where you can see that we are about two times faster. Now, this is not because Dual SPH is uh, 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 coded badly, but Dual SPH does not exploit symmetry in the interactions, and we exploit symmetry, which should give you a factor of two. Um, and uh, this is a grid-based simulation compared to the AMRX code uh, of a reaction diffusion system on the grid, and again, the wall clock times are comparable. The difference being, of course, that the OpenFPM clients can be implemented in a couple of hours, and most of these other codes um, have uh, several person years of effort inside. Another nice thing about template metaprogramming in scientific computing is that we can switch now to GPUs, for example, or multi-GPU clusters. Again, you see the same dam break experiment here run on a GTX 1080, where it ran about 200 times faster than on a Xeon core. And there was very minimal change uh, to the source code that needed to be made. Importantly, there was no CUDA that had to be written by the application programmer, but all the CUDA code was automatically generated by the compiler. And OpenFPM supports two types of GPU programming, the more traditional kernel-based paradigm, but the kernel does not have to be written in CUDA, but in C++, or something that is really more like NumPy or MATLAB, um, where you use vector notation and tensor notation, and then the CUDA code gets automatically generated. And for those that wish to learn more about this and how it works, there is going to be a poster uh, about the GPU part uh, of OpenFPM on this conference. And now as an outlook, um, what we're currently working on together um, with uh, Professor Castrillon, uh, Professor for Compiler Construction and Programming Languages, is to revamp also the domain-specific language um, that one may or may not use. Again, you can directly interface with the Open uh, 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 FPM C++ uh, uh, API, but you can also use this domain-specific language, which very much looks like Python has uh, a, a nice editor where pieces of code can be collapsed and expanded so you don't lose overview. Um, but there are two things that I would like to point out here specifically. One is that the equations you would like to solve, in this case, uh, a particle method for PDEs, um, are input into the source code in a more or less mathematical notation. So it's, it's reasonably easy to take this set of equations here of the gray scott reaction diffusion system and just write them like this. The numerical methods that are going to be used to solve these equations are defined up here, where I, for example, say I want to use a runge kutta method of order 4 for the time integration, and I want to use a PSE stencil for the Laplacian. And all the C++ code or the CUDA code required to discretize these equations with these methods and run it in a parallel MPI environment and, and do file I.O. and visualization is generated for me. This hopefully makes HPC so easy to use that every application scientist in biology, in computational biology, but also in other fields, um, uh, uh, can benefit and can focus more on their science and less on the coding. Another uh, uh, ongoing project for which there is a poster um, at this conference is real-time in situ visualization in our virtual reality environment. So we would not only use that to visualize microscopy images, but really also to visualize running simulations as they run, and to hopefully be able to use hand gestures uh, or finger gestures in the virtual reality to interact with the simulation, to steer the simulation. You see here a video from our virtual reality cave, two of my PhD students looking at a simulation of mouse liver. And again, um, there is a poster in the PhD forum and a talk this afternoon about this. 
Um, and of course, because particle methods are not limited to simulations, we also use them for the real-time image processing. This is a large block of voxels uh, 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 showing a, fly, a fruit fly embryo. This is the segmentation we get um, with our codes uh, where uh, the computer identifies the location and shape of every cell in this tissue uh, in order to be able to track it and to describe it. Uh, this is a segmentation you get with some other code. Um, and the important thing is that, of course, the image is decomposed into blocks, and the blocks are sent to different uh, processing nodes. So one node really only has to solve a very small segmentation problem, um, like shown down here, um, which can be done faster than the microscope acquires the image. And then, of course, there's network communication at the boundaries and so on to ensure that collectively the processors solve the global problem. Um, but they do it so fast that we will be able to uh, have this in real time. And of course, uh, the main motivation is to understand biology and to understand how cells form tissues and eventually to be able to provide novel explanations for disease phenotypes and maybe novel therapies for disease. But for us as computer scientists, it's also just a lot of fun because what we do combine, combines several technologies um, that we think are fun to work with, technologies like virtual reality, high-performance computing, massively scalable uh, software systems, building microscopes and playing with optics, um, or using and developing artificial intelligence and learning algorithms uh, to interface with the living thing in the microscope, sort of like in a cyber biological system, if you want to call it that. And the last slide. With this, I would like to close by uh, thanking, of course, um, all our collaborators, both um, at the CSPD in Dresden, but also uh, worldwide, uh, without whom uh, uh, none of this would have been possible, and who challenge us with their uh, biological problems and provide us with images uh, and uh, 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 other data, biochemical data. I also uh, thank all the former and present members of my group and in particular I would like to shout out to the person, the persons uh, uh, highlighted in bold here. Aryaman Gupta is a PhD student in my lab who works on the in situ visualization and computational steering and he's going to present this afternoon. Uh, Tristoff is our software engineer, is a professional uh, uh, software engineer with 10 years of industry experience who takes care of our open source projects, of documenting them and of making sure the codes are nice. Ulrich is the PhD student who developed um, the virtual reality code scenery uh, and the, the big data rendering pipeline. Pietro is the lead developer of OpenFPM um, and Surya is uh, the main guy in my group behind the uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the learning of PDEs uh, from data. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, OpenFPM is not the only open source project we have at our center. We also develop Fiji, which is a very widely used platform for biological and medical image processing, segmentation, tracking, interaction analysis, image enhancement with more than 3,000 downloads per month. Uh, it's pretty much used in every biology lab around the world. Uh, we also have um, OpenFPM, of course, as a simulation framework. PPME as a domain-specific high-level language uh, for particle methods. Clear Volume is a software that we use to control microscopes and to stream data off microscope cameras uh, in real time. And Scenery is the uh, uh, open source virtual reality rendering framework that supports both volumetric voxel data and geometric scenes um, at 120 hertz uh, rendering performance. Um, and uh, is completely open source, to my knowledge, may even be the only open source virtual reality uh, piece out there. Thank you very much. Uh, for his uh, excellent talks. Yes, I, I believe everyone will be uh, very impressive about your efforts to make the HPC easy to use and let the scientists focus on their science. That's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. Now we have a few minutes for questions. Do you have any questions? Okay. Microphone. Microphone, yeah. Peace. 
Where was the map? Okay, thank you. John Gustafson, National University of Singapore. Uh, thank you for an excellent and uh, riveting keynote. I was wondering, now that 16-bit floating point is becoming more and more available, especially on GPUs, have you experimented with half precision or lower precision, and are you currently using 32-bit precision for most of your work, or are you, are you forced to use 64-bit? It's a very good question, and it does depend on the application and the type of numerics that uh, we want to simulate. So for um, the dam break uh, test case, which I have shown uh, uh, on the GTX 1080, that was floating point uh, precision, so that was 32-bit. Uh, uh, um, uh, we never experimented with even lower precision. Um, for the active mechanics simulations, we have to use 64-bit, and sometimes even hash that double because the nonlinearities in the equation are such that even the slightest round of error is going to amplify to the power of four. And within just a few time steps, the simulation would be garbage. So we really require very high um, uh, precision there. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Professor, it's a very nice talk. So I have a question about the, your the first part. And uh, there, you have used the one mutation and assuming that from the simulation, it uh, explains why the mutation causes uh, the failing of the chloe. And uh, my question is uh, for the system biology, kind of like it's uh, popular to use some genomic data. And did you have tried to use some genomic data, for example, the INSEQ or some even more? Uh, because it's very different from some kind of image data. Right. Yeah, of course, I, uh, I would like to precise maybe the statement uh, um, that I have made a little bit. So, of course, the simulation does not show that this is how it works. The simulation only shows that this is how it could work. Uh, the simulation shows sufficiency of the physical mechanism, but, of course, there could be a hundred others that do the same thing. It is then the biochemical experiment that actually goes in and finds the very protein and finds its function, characterizes it, that shows that this is actually also necessary. But the simulation can help the experimentation, can guide the experimentation, so uh, the biochemists know what to look for. Um, genomic data does not really help you explain the physical mechanisms by which a phenotype arises. Genomic information, of course, um, allows you to explain where the mutation is, and it allows you to explain how this protein may be evolutionarily linked to humans, uh, which is very important information but it would not be able to predict under what level of chemical activity the tissue would go turbulent, right? because that's an essentially physical uh, process. So we need to combine both. Um, the genomic data are the classic in systems biology, which are there to identify the genes and to find the mutations and to be able to make statements like this is a single amino acid substitution in crumbs. But then in order to figure out what this substitution does, I think we need physics-based models. Thank you. I think we have uh, one opportunity for the last one question. Okay. Um, at the end of your talk, you have shown us a very impressive piece of code. Um, so it was the uh, a C code, and uh, it would allow us to insert a partial differential equation yes. into it. And that that's the first time ever I've seen it. So how do I know what numerical method will be used actually to discretize the uh, equation afterwards? Yes. Um, Can we uh, go back to that slide, please? Uh, just uh, go back a couple of slides until we have again the screenshot of the code up here. That would help. This one. Yes, thank you. Um, so this is a screenshot, a real screenshot from our editor. Um, and uh, you see here that you insert the partial differential equation. And now, of course, the question was, how do I tell the compiler what numerical method uh, to use? And the answer is uh, uh, reasonably simple. You tell it by importing the corresponding modules up here. For example, when I say here, import Runge Kutta from schemes as RK4, um, that tells the compiler that the time stepping should be done with a Runge Kutta method of order four. And when I say up here, uh, import Laplace PSC 2D from stencils as LAP, uh, then it tells the compiler I want to use a uh, uh, 2D uh, finite difference stencil for the Laplacian. 
and we have a library of numerical methods that one can choose from. And of course, we hope to make it reasonably easy for open source communities to also contribute their own libraries there. Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky to write those libraries because the compiler needs to be able to parse them. You need to write down the BNF grammar um, and, 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 and the variadic templates, but it's possible. Okay. Let's thank the speakers again. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.